how do you uh, make investments, you know, how do you know something's a great idea or not. And I think I thought what I'd do is I'd uh, take the example of, of one investment uh, that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger made, uh, which was the investment in Coca-Cola. And I, I wanted to go through the, uh, the mo models they used when they made this investment. So there was no spreadsheet uh, ever created when they did the Coke investment from then till today. It's been about almost 30 years since they made the investment. Uh, they have no analysts or associates or anyone who helps them. Um, I, I, I don't even believe they made much in terms of notes uh, when they made the investment. Uh, but they thought very deeply about it. And, and for most investments, um, if you can't do the math in your head, uh, then it should be an automatic pass. Uh, so there was no DCF model run for Coke. Coke. There was no, uh, uh, there was no, no uh, numbers based uh, models. I mean, they, they had some numbers in their mind, uh, but they never, I don't think they ever reduced them to paper. Uh, but they did have, uh, I think, uh, and I may be missing some of them, but I think there were dozens upon dozens of models that they used in in making uh, the investment and what happens is that when when you have an overlay between models uh, that's when you get uh, what charlie munger calls lula palooza effects you know one plus one becomes 11. and so it's really kind of the interplay between the models uh, that lead to kind of the aha moment and such so uh, charlie munger had given a speech uh, to a group that basically elected to be secret. They told him not to disclose the name of the group that he gave that speech to. And uh, after he gave the speech, uh, where part of the speech covered uh, the Coke investment, uh, they told him it was a useless speech. Uh, that, you know, and so uh, uh, they didn't appreciate it. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I actually think it's one of his, uh, more brilliant speeches and actually gives you a, a window into how they think. So, so I think it's useful. So anyway, uh, the Coke investment that Burke made, Berkshire Hathaway made was made between 1988 and 1990, about a three year period when they bought the stock. And uh, at the time they invested about 1.3 billion uh, into Coke and 1.3 billion at that time was approximately one fourth of the book value of Berkshire Hathaway. So they made a very significant bet. I mean, you think of an insurance company taking one fourth of their equity into a single stock, and that's what they did at the time. And uh, so, and uh, the last bit of Coke that, that Warren bought in 1990 was bought at uh, about 25 times trailing earnings. Uh, so it wasn't uh, cheap uh, by traditional metrics that you, that you might, might use. Um, but on, on many fronts, they considered a no-brainer, and obviously they've now uh, not touched that position for um, almost like you know approaching 30 years. And I don't think they're going to touch that position even well after Warren and Charlie are gone uh, from the scene. So I, I, I don't think the Coke position is going to get touched at Berkshire for a very long time. Uh, so why do they make the investment, right? And what what went through their minds? Uh, to make the investment. And uh, so one of the things that uh, Warren and Charlie have said is that if they had not invested in C's candy, uh, they would have never ever invested in Coke. So to understand the Coke investment, we should go back to the C's candy investment because that'll give us some clues. So um, when, when the Coke, uh, when the Coke, uh, uh, idea came in front of them. There were a couple of things that were different from different about Coke from C's. The first thing was that Coke traveled really well, and they could see that. So they had repeatedly, repeatedly tried to take this brand into even the neighboring states. They couldn't do that. Um, there are only two countries today in the world uh, where you cannot get Coke, and. Um, and uh, I forget there's North Korea is one of them. I forget what's the second. Pardon? Yeah, Cuba. That's right. So Cuba and North Korea are the only two countries uh, where you cannot get Coke today, right? But but what they noticed is that 
in, even in these two countries, if Coke tomorrow started selling in these countries with no advertising, it would take off in quite a significant way because it's, you know, that that brand uh, has meaning even to people who have never drunk Coke before and never seen an ad because it's so, so much part of pop culture and movies and whatnot that it's, it's entrenched. So, um, so basically what they, what they found is that unlike, unlike C's, uh, Coke traveled really well. And, and Warren, uh, Warren studied this phenomena of the difficulty of traveling with C's very carefully because he was very interested in making C's global. He would have loved for C's to become a global company. And with all the brain power they had, they could never do that. And, but here was a company that was naturally a global company. The second thing he noticed that was different between C's and Coke, uh, so you know, he's been drinking five Cokes a day uh, since he was six years old. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, Coke's been a regular part of his diet for like 80 years or something. And uh, so the second thing he, he, he noticed was that uh, there was a limit to the amount of fudge you could eat. Uh, you know, so as you eat more fudge or seize candy, your ability to eat more of it uh, declines. And but with Coke, you know, the lack of an aftertaste uh, means that the ability to consume Coke was quite significantly higher than the ability to consume candy. In fact, the uh, a person can consume five or six Cokes a day pretty much for their whole lives without really feeling like they were having something monotonous. And many of us do that. How many, how many of you have uh, one or more Coke products daily? No one admits to having Cokes. <laughs> so um, uh, actually you're having other Coke products, you just don't recognize that they're made by the company. Uh, they've got like over 100 brands. So, um, uh, so the second thing they recognized was that, um, that unlike, unlike fudge and peanut butter brittle and such, that uh, peanut brittle, I'm sorry, that, uh, that you couldn't, uh, uh, Coke, you had no aftertaste, and so the volume you could consume and the frequency with which you consume it was quite different. And in fact, even uh, if you compare it to something like McDonald's, which is a very good model, but if you were eating at McDonald's every day, uh, that will could probably get to you uh, much faster than consuming Cokes every day. So they noticed that uh, this particular product has this nuance of recurring consumption, not really. Uh, being an issue uh, in terms of purchase. So th these were some of the models that they knew about before they um, before they started to uh, started to research uh, Coke. And the third thing they also recognized difference between C's and Coke, what with, was with C's, you needed retail space, right? So they had to have a C's store and you know pay rent and all these things to sell it. But Coke, uh, got sold in all these places where uh, the company didn't pay any rent. You know, it was just sold all over the place. So it had, it had, uh, and I'll go through a little more details about the kind of the, the capital light model of Coke. So there were a number of reasons why Coke uh, was very capital efficient, uh, far more capital efficient than even C's was. So even though C's in 84 was producing uh, 13 million on 20 million invested capital, I mean, that's a very high return, you know, 65% return on invested capital, really good business. Coke was even better than that. It, it was a truly remarkable business. And um, so then the, the second part of the mental models that come in is that uh, uh, Warren and Charlie like to go through long histories of these companies that they, that they study. So, uh, with Coke, both of them read every annual report uh, since the company was public. So they start, they, they read every annual report from 1919, which is when Coke went public, until uh, the, the late 80s, every single annual report. And uh, they got some insights from reading those annual reports. And one of the insights they got was that uh, from the period of 1919 to let's say 87, there had been, there had never been a year when Coke's unit or, or, or cases sold was lower than the previous year. So through the Great Depression, through the Second World War, through the Korean War, through uh, all the stagflation of the 70s, through all of that, 
unit case volume just every single year went up over the previous year uh, nonstop. Uh, and um, and 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 the second thing that they noticed was that Coke, which started in uh, in Rome, Georgia, uh, went through this uh, major international expansion. So they were repeatedly over the years. Uh, they were first only in the southern U.S., then they kind of spread out through the U.S. and then Canada, and then they started spreading out. And in fact, World War II took them to all the places where the uh, U.S. Army went. And um, and so they they saw the whole uh, uh, way Coke entered one new country after another, and what happened after they entered the country. So they 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 could see that from the reading of those reports and. What they concluded was that uh, the runway was really long, and uh, and I'll I'll get to the runway. So the way they defined the runway uh, from reading Coke is that humans humans need to ingest water to survive, right? So we need to ingest about sixty four ounces of water a day to survive, and uh, humans prefer uh, to consume flavored water over plain water. So at least some portion of that 64 ounces, uh, they prefer to consume flavored versus plain. In fact, Warren's daughter says that she's never ever seen her dad drink water. You know, she, she, she says she's never seen her dad drink a bottle of water or drink a glass of water, never happened. Um, and so Warren, I think what uh, uh, 40 ounces a day is coming from Coke. I don't know where the other 24 ounces are coming from, but she says water is not part of the deal. And um, so, so if you take the 64 ounces that humans have to drink, uh, they figured that at infinity, you'd probably get to something like 50% of that volume uh, gets consumed in one way or another in a flavored format. And you can take that today where if you look at something like Dasani, which is a Coke brand for water as part of that, so you know, some kind of bottled uh, kind of uh, beverage becomes about half of it. And they, they felt that Coke could probably take 50 percent of the, um, of, of half of, uh, of that, uh, of the, of the flavored portion. So 16 ounces uh, per day per person, which is two servings. And um, so they just looked at the unit volume, they looked at the number of servings, they looked at the number of humans. And they looked at that runway and they said that we've got a long ways to go here. And so you've got basically um, this distribution engine where you can pump a lot of brands through it, you know, Minute Maid and, uh, you know, Monster and all these, all these things. And uh, world population was growing. So as world population grew, co-consumption would grow. GDP was growing in countries where GDP is very low. So, you know, if you look at a country like Mexico, for example, the per capita coke consumption in Mexico is the highest in the world. It's it's above the U.S. Um, and there are other countries in the world where they are at one hundredth of Mexico's uh, volume. So uh, so coke would grow as it went into new countries. It would grow as GDP grew. It would grow as uh, per capita consumption grew. And um, so that was another part of what they learned from reading those annual reports. And then. Uh, Warren read this uh, Fortune article, which was written in 1938, about Coke, and the writer of the Fortune article said that you know this is a marvelous, marvelous company. In 1938, has done so well, and and then he said, well, of course the ride's over because the company went public in 1919 at 40 dollars a share, and now that is worth uh, 3,300 per share. Uh, if you you know, go back to the stock splits and all that. So they said, you know, the so the writer of that article said, you know, it's great to know that, but you know, the ride's over. And Warren says the ride was not over because if in 1938 you invested a fresh forty dollars into Coke, by 1993 it was twenty five thousand. Uh, so so you had you could have missed the first twenty years, and you still had runway after that. And so they another another model they used was they didn't have an anchoring bias. Uh, a lot of times in investing, what happens, and in fact I'm very guilty of that, is uh, we tend to look at kind of past performance of of a, of a security, and that 
taints the way we look at it. And actually what you really ought to do is ignore the past, just focus on the future. And so they were really good at not having this bias about, hey, this company has been growing from 1884 till 100 plus years. Now we want to invest in it. And 100 years after this company got formed, we're putting one fourth of our capital in. Have we lost it? They didn't think about it that way. And um, and then you know the some of the other things they they realized is that the the company was currency proof. It was uh, asteroid proof. It was thermonuclear blast proof. Uh, it was uh, anarchy proof. It was pretty much uh, bulletproof of any way you look at it. So if you think about a situation where uh, you have, let's say, a uh, LE extension level event take place, right? So let's say an asteroid comes in, and let's say the asteroid takes out six and a half out of, out of the seven billion humans. Let's say we're left with a few hundred million. Well, the Coca Cola company has the trademark and uh, they have the formula, and they will eventually start producing Coke again and they will probably get back into business and, and such. And you could not say that about almost any other business when you have that sort of an event take place. And so even if uh, currencies changed or got devalued or whatever happened, uh, Warren's perspective was that people would be willing to trade two minutes of labor for a Coke. And so the, the trading of labor versus coke uh, would be independent of, of currency. So that was another um, part of the part of the model. And then you know the, the notion that uh, our mouths are a very personal space, right? There's a few spaces humans have kind of very, you know, are very sensitive about. Mouth is one of them. And uh, we are kind of uh, sensitive about what we put into our mouths. And so um, if you see a Coke and you've had it in the past, et cetera, you won't think twice. And even if you're in a different country, you'll have it, no problem. But if you see some kind of unknown brand, it's kind of like, you know, you, you eat Wrigley's chewing gum and then uh, someone presents to you Glotz chewing gum and, you know, says, would you like some? You know, you're probably not going to take it. And uh, so, so the, our mouth is a very personal space and we're not going to be messing around with trying to take the low bid on what goes into our mouth. So they, they felt that we are creatures of habit. Once we get these habits formed, uh, then we're not going to be willing to change them, especially with personal spaces like our mouth. And, uh, and the second is about humans are creatures of habit. You know, like we, we, we shave every day on the same side of the face first, or in the case of ladies, the same leg first. We do things in a certain pattern, and uh, and again, once we get to those habits and patterns, uh, we are reluctant to make those changes. So they they saw all these things, and they saw all of this was kind of coming together from their reading of the annual reports, and then they looked at the, you know. So I have already probably gone through maybe twenty or thirty different models they used. We have, we still have a lot more to go. 